Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're here for our 11 o'clock hour of worship. Uh, If you're a guest, we're especially glad that you have joined us today. Pleased that God has uh, seen fit to bring you here. Uh, If you are a visitor, that you'll find a card in the pew in front of you. It says, Welcome. And if you are visiting with us, we would love for you to take just a few moments to fill that out. There's even a place on the back for you to put prayer requests, and we are diligent to pray for those requests every week. Uh, God just continues to bless our church by bringing new folks in. Uh, We had two people who uh, professed faith in Christ and were baptized this morning at 8.30. So that was a wonderful time. And also, uh, last night we were able to have our Taste of Liberty, uh, where there were literally dozens of people who are new to our church and uh, uh, came and just had a time of fellowship and ate food. And it was uh, just a wonderful time as well. So we're just so glad that God has, just continues to allow us to, to meet together and to grow. Uh, a couple of things I'll bring your attention to in your proclaimer today. Uh, tonight, a couple of things going on. From 5 until 8 p.m., uh, the youth and the children are having a skate night at AJ Skate World. That is from 5 until 8 p.m. Uh, at AJ Skate World. And we want this, this is an, a free event. And uh, it's for the family, so if you want to bring the whole family, if you have kids in Awana or even if they don't participate in Awana uh, or in youth, uh, we will be at AJ Skate World. You'll drop off from there at 5 and pick up at AJ Skate World at 8 p.m. We would love for the whole family to be a part of this. Again, it's a free event, so come on out for skate night tonight from 5 until 8 p.m. Another thing is our congregational meeting tonight is uh, after the gathering. And uh, you can learn at our congregational meeting where God has brought us in the past few months, uh, some things that you can make decisions on tonight, uh, some approve, disapprove uh, cards will be given out tonight for your uh, approval at our congregational meeting. And uh, also you can learn about what God is getting ready to do, what we believe God is leading us to do uh, here at Liberty Baptist. So please uh, join us for our congregational meeting tonight uh, following the gathering. The third thing I'll mention is our ladies' Bible study, the uh, seven experiment. And there are two of these. There's uh, one that meets at 9 a.m. at Baines. Uh, I believe your proclaimer may say 8.30 uh, in in one place, but it's actually at 9 a.m. at Baines on Saturdays and at Tuesdays at 7 p.m. here at the church. So either one of those, they run parallel, so you could join uh, either one of those as you have time. There's another a new Sunday school class, uh, Middle Age and Muddling Through is an adult Sunday school class that is meeting at Baines, uh, and you can read more about that in your proclaimer as well. Uh, the uh, we have another class called the Spirit Walkers, which has been meeting for a while now, uh, but Alan Austin is, uh, they're about ready to start a new book, so uh, Alan, would you tell us a little bit about this new study? Good morning. I just want to um, make a personal invitation to come and join us uh, for a study on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're entitled Unleash the Power, and um, I think that's something that uh, all of us can um, attest to that we uh, we need lives full of power and so as we study this uh, book by Francis Chan called Forgotten God we're going to uh, walk through that um, it, it's our hope that it won't just be um, about a bunch of facts and things about the Holy Spirit but we're really hoping that we can really uh, discover how to really experience the Holy Spirit so I want to invite you to that uh, Sunday school class. We meet at the Babcock House. I think the slide says the first room on the right, but it's actually the first room on the left. Unless you're leaving the building, then it is the first room on the right. So, so we, were, we were both right. But anyway, come join us. Uh, let us know, uh, and we'll get you a book. Uh, this morning, uh, all the books went out, but we can get more books. So um, just um, show up next Sunday morning. Or if you want to uh, let the church office know that you're interested in that class. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Um, there is uh, another good news announcement is that uh, we have now the ability to give online. Uh, online giving. And so uh, you can go to our website, libertybconline.org. And I know it's a long website, but if you mark it as a, uh, a bookmark or a favorite, it's pretty easy to find it after that. Uh, you can go on there, and if there at the very beginning of the of the website, you can find out it's just a few clicks, and you can set up online giving. Just another way, if you want to uh, give a gift to uh, the church uh, or set up regular get your regular giving, you can do that online now. 
So we're very pleased to be able to do that as well. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is our uh, annual Patrick Henry Boys and Girls Home Banquet. Uh, that is on Saturday, February 9th at 6 p.m. Uh, we do invite you to come. It's a wonderful time just to, uh, to encourage those young people and to provide them with a, a meal. It'll be around 80 folks, so we're going to need lots of food for that. Uh, please come and bring a covered dish. That would be uh, much appreciated. There will be fun and games, and there, we also will show a movie after the meal. Uh, if you can't come, you can, still, uh, you can still bring food and provide in that way. Uh, again, we'll need to feed about 80 people, so we will need uh, to uh, provide quite a bit of food for that as well. Uh, and so please just uh, pray about how we can encourage the Patrick Henry Boys and Girls Home by... Uh, by providing this meal for them as well. So uh, many great things going on in the life of our church. Pray that you'll get involved with them. As we begin our time together, why don't we stand and greet one another? Let's sing together. Bind us together. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. come together to sing worship and praise to our King. Let's worship Him together. Let us 
today our heart is grieved for the many families that are hurting. God, we think of the family of Robert Poole today who is, they're grieving. God, we think today about Glenn and June, the death of their son, or his son, they're grieving. God, we think today about Robert Chenault, who's in bad condition. God, we grieve for him. God, we pray for his healing. But then we got Drew today, who's really struggling. God, we pray for him. God, there are so many, there have been a lot of recent funerals, a lot of bereaved people. And so, God, this is just the tip of the iceberg and in the, in, in the amount of grief that this church family is feeling. And so, God, today, we pray for Charlie Mitchell as well. God, we just pray you would wrap your arms around all of these folks who are struggling. God, may you allow us to be your hands and feet and minister to these people in their grief. God, we thank you that you are the God of all comfort. And so may you be that to this, these families. And God, we ask uh, for you to hold back some of this grief. Uh, we pray that uh, you would spare us from any more deaths, for any more struggles. Uh, but God, if they come, we just pray that we would be your church, and that, God, we call on your comfort and your presence to meet these people where they are and to do for them only what you can do. And so, God, we lift up the hurting people in our church family today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. his name. He reigns. We don't have a thousand voices here, but we have a few hundred. Let's stand together as we sing our great Redeemer's praise this morning.
thank you, Lord, that you brought us here this day. We're thankful for everyone that's represented here. We pray for those families who, through grief or sickness, are unable to be with us. Bring comfort and strength to them, Lord. Let us as church families reach out to them and check on them and make sure they're okay. We thank you, Lord, that you bring us together. We thank you for the great mercy that you give us, Lord, your, your son's death that redeemed us. Let us glory in that power, Lord. Let us others see it in us. May we reach out to others with these offerings that we bring and let us know of your grace within this community. Bless us and keep us in your name, I pray. Amen.
The question is today, what do you desire to happen as part of your spiritual life, as part of your Christian life? You know, I think the question we need to ask ourselves is, what's supposed to be happening? What is our Christian life supposed to look like? How do we know we're making progress? How do we know we're doing what God wants us to do? How do we even know what it is that God wants us to do? These are worthy questions to ask ourselves. Is what's supposed to be happening? Am I doing it right? Are you doing it right? Is, is our life pleasing to God? I mean, the questions that we need to ponder is, is it enough just to do right spiritual things? Is that all God's requiring of us? Is our spiritual life measured by how much we attend church or how much we understand the Bible or how much we serve others or how much we give or how much we pray? Is, is that it? Is that all God wants? Does He just want us to do these certain things? By the way, I'm not minimizing these activities. Certainly, I'd promote church attendance and understanding the Bible and serving others and giving and praying. But is that it? You know, I would propose to you today that that can't be it. 
Because you know people, and I know people, maybe you are one of these people, and maybe I am one of these people, who do all of these things, read the Bible, pray, serve, give, and yet some people are still loaded down with struggle. Now on the one hand, I don't want to be overly optimistic, because I'm not trying to say that we ought to be perfect, certainly not. We certainly can't be sinless, not this side of eternity. The Bible tells us that we groan, longing to be set free of this body of sin and to be placed in a whole new type of existence. So in this life we won't rid ourselves of trouble, but I do believe that the normal Christian life, the appropriate Christian life, we never arrive, but there should be moments of deeper levels of awareness and deeper, deeper levels of growth in our Christian life. And this isn't necessarily about knowing, and this isn't necessarily about doing. This is about something that I believe happens in our heart, and only we and God know. This is the way it goes. And people who have looked through church history notice times when God's church really comes to not just knowing more about him and not just doing things, more things for him, but really something happens deep down inside. And these times have been called spiritual awakenings, where God's people do more than just know and do more than just do. God's people become something different. Now, the people who study these types of things Several things happen. I think when I think about this, the prophet Isaiah, I know I'm preaching in Daniel, but I've got to deal with Isaiah. Because I feel like he is really the example for us of someone who was doing a lot of the right things. The great prophet of Israel. Yet in Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says Isaiah saw the Lord. It fundamentally changed him. It fundamentally changed the way he dealt with God and others. The Bible says when Isaiah saw the Lord, he said, I am undone. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And all of this awareness came to him because he saw the Lord and thus saw himself in light of it. This is what real spiritual awakening, I believe, looks like. And God really wants to prepare us for this type of encounter with him. No, so much of our life is full of delusion. We think we see everything so properly and rightly only to find out that when we see the Lord sometimes, we figure out that a lot of the conceptions that we have about ourselves are quite frankly very misguided. This is really the essence of what God has been doing with King Nebuchadnezzar for literally weeks now. As we look at him, God is trying to strip back the illusions that Nebuchadnezzar has of himself God is trying to get Nebuchadnezzar to see himself, not to condemn Nebuchadnezzar, but ultimately to save Nebuchadnezzar. Not to, not to destroy Nebuchadnezzar, but actually to avoid destruction that Nebuchadnezzar is really plunging himself forward. Spiritual awakening happens in us when we do some things. First of all, we get a clearer vision of ourselves. Sometimes this is a slow process, and sometimes God just gives it to us in a hurry. He says, look, this is who you really are. And then in the moment of seeing ourselves, we also get a clear vision of who God is and His holiness and His righteousness and His justice and His grace. And when those two things happen, God's people do another thing. They genuinely repent. Now, repent is kind of a Christian word, but it simply means to agree with God and to change the direction of your life, to say, God, I'm going to agree with you about myself. I'm going to say what you say is right, what I think is wrong, and I, now I'm going to not just head and hands, but heart, I'm going to give myself to you. This genuine repentance, the, the problem with repentance is that it is painful, no doubt about that. Listen, if, if your Christian life doesn't have a little bit of pain around the edges because you're changing, then you ought to be highly concerned about your spiritual life. Because without what I call the hound dog of heaven, the Holy Spirit kind of all the time bringing things to your mind and heart. If, if that's not happening, you might want to dial back in and say, Holy Spirit of God, speak to my heart. When, when we see ourselves and see God, genuine repentance happens. 
And in the moment of repentance, really two things begin to happen simultaneously. Number one, we pray, and right out of our prayer comes praise. They just kind of happen both. I've been with people when real repentance has happened, and I can't distinguish between the crying that is repentance and the crying that is praise. It's all kind of just mixed up together. It's all there just happening all at a moment. And yet that's not bad pain, that's good pain, that's healing pain, that's God kind of setting our soul like a broken bone back in place to say, now you can be the type of person that I wanted you to be, that now that you've given me this particular area in your life. So I would propose today that God is not just seeking out of us a better spiritual routine, as good as spiritual routine is, and that I embrace it. Rather, God is looking, He really is, for an inside-out transformation, something that happens in our heart. It's not just something that we do, it's something that we are, something that God does in us. And then our Christian life is truly punctuated along the way by moments of deepened awareness of Him. And I hope if you look back over your life, you can see moments in time where you can put your finger down and say, you know what, that was a moment of real spiritual awakening for me. And that moment was a moment where God really dealt with something that I hadn't seen before now, but I saw it then and there. I made a real change in the road. And then there's another moment, and I think our life should be punctuated along the way. The thing is, this never stops it's punctuated along the way. But when real spiritual awakening happens in a person's heart or in a church, it's not just an emotional experience that lasts for a moment. It's like a plane that takes on a new trajectory of service and love for other people. And by the way, this is what God desires, not only He desires of all of us. He wants us to become the person that He wants us to be. He does. And here's the thing about God, is God is awfully persistent. And also God has all the tools necessary to get our attention. Now the, the truth of the matter is, God gives us a free will to choose, but God is determined to ever put the choice to choose before us. He'll just keep, you say no to this way, you've got to figure out another way. He'll say, well, are you going to make it? You're going to deal with me. Say, no, 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 I'm not going to deal with you this way. He says, that's fine, I'll deal with you this way. Oh, no, 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 I'm not going to deal with you this way. I'll deal with you this way. And so no matter how much we run, God always has a way of keeping the choice ever before us of all the unlikely characters for God to do this with. I would say King Nebuchadnezzar would be the last guy. I would just like, I mean, you know, if I was writing the story, I would think King Nebuchadnezzar would pass off the scene God would go, enough with that old guy for messing around, hurting people, destroying people. I have no use for the him. Get off of the pages of human history into eternity and get out of here as fast as you can. And that's not the guy we find at all. I mean, of all the unlikely characters for God to pursue, King Nebuchadnezzar would be an unlikely character. In many ways, King Nebuchadnezzar becomes almost a personification of an anti-God figure until the end of the story, where we see in Daniel chapter 4 that God says, I'm not going to let you go. He says, I am going to pursue you. I am going to come after you. I am going to demand that you give me your attention. And there are going to be some choices that you will make, but I am going to put the choice ever before you. Would you imagine that the story, not just of the book of Daniel, but the story of Nebuchadnezzar, will end on a redemptive note. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't read it. And here it is in Daniel chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, let's go there. Daniel chapter 4, where we will see the importance of responding to God and to His conviction with humility. The first point today is God reigns. So we may be aware of the manifestations of God's activity in His world We've been a Christian for any time period, or even if you're not a Christian, you may be aware that God's up to something, and you're beginning to see that He's up to something. Well, so has Nebuchadnezzar. Listen to the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar on where God has brought him up to this point in his life. Verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the earth, may your prosperity increase. 
I am pleased to tell you about the miracles, the wonders the Most High God has done for me. How great are His miracles, how mighty His wonders, His kingdom is eternal, and His dominion is from generation to generation. So interestingly enough, God has been working in King Nebuchadnezzar's life. When we met King Nebuchadnezzar right out the gate, he almost thought he was God. He thought he ruled the ancient world. He was it. Remember, he built himself a huge statue almost to say, I am God. Uh, I, I've got it all. And so God has dispatched a few people to Nebuchadnezzar to rattle his view of things. He has dispatched to him a Daniel to interpret his dreams. And that's begun to kind of rattle his brains a little bit and say, well, maybe there is a God in heaven who can understand dreams and mysteries. And then God dispatches to King Nebuchadnezzar a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They come out of the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar is starting to have to come to terms with the fact that maybe God's up to something. Several times in the book up until this point, we see Nebuchadnezzar say, yep, God's up to something. God's a ruler of heaven and earth. Yes, God's doing something that I can't put in my box, but I don't know exactly what it is. But Nebuchadnezzar is moving, he's making some progress in his own spiritual life. The truth of the matter is, Nebuchadnezzar will quickly pass off the scene. After Daniel chapter 4, we will never see Nebuchadnezzar again. He will be gone. And it's interesting to see what God is doing with Nebuchadnezzar. I want us to reflect just briefly on the idea of spiritual progress, or I may even make the phrase spiritual preparation. It could go either way here. God wants Nebuchadnezzar to get somewhere. God wants Nebuchadnezzar to truly align his heart with the heart of God. He really wants that to happen. And so God is, is, is really, in his grace, pulling on Nebuchadnezzar, making Nebuchadnezzar face himself and face God. I mean, he sent him Daniel, he sent him Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar's making progress, but we're going to see here in a moment not enough progress. He hasn't gotten to the place where God really wants him to be. You know, the truth is God wants us all to get somewhere. He wants us all to be making progress in our spiritual life. And this progress isn't just up to us. This progress is initiated by God. God's the one who's pulling us in certain directions. And, and I think as you reflect on your own life, do you, do you see where God is pulling you? Do you see what He's trying to communicate to you? And the question you have to ask yourself is, are you making progress? Are you saying, yes, God, I'll go, or no, God, I won't? You know, our life doesn't have to be full of spiritual progress, by the way. If you're honest, your life is full of progress and regress. The old saying, two steps forward, one step back, well, that's kind of the way I do it. Maybe you do it differently. But, but the truth is, is that the whole of our life should, if, if we live in an ideal world, should be more progress than regress. We have to think about the fact, where is God trying to get you to go? He's trying to get Nebuchadnezzar to go somewhere and is preparing the ground. And Nebuchadnezzar is making progress but God's going to say, Nebuchadnezzar, I have brought you right up to the line. Now you need to step over it. It's going to be one of the most difficult things Nebuchadnezzar is going to do. And God's going to have to do a lot to put the choice before him in a big way. The reason I know Nebuchadnezzar hasn't gone far enough is point number two. Point number two is God reigns. So we must respond appropriately to God's conviction in our life. Verse 4 says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I had a dream and it frightened me while in my bed the images and visions in my mind alarmed me. As far as my slides, I'm going to skip all the way down to verse 10 there, Michael. I'm doing it different than it's up there. Verse 10 says, In the visions of my mind, as I was lying in bed, I saw this. There was a tree in the middle of the earth, and its height was great. 
The tree grew large and strong, its top reached to the sky, and it was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit was abundant, and on it was food for all. Wild animals found shelter under it, the birds of the air lived in its branches, and every creature was fed from it. As I was lying in my bed, I also saw in the visions of my mind an observer, a holy one, coming down from heaven. And he called out loudly, cut down the tree and chop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump with its roots in the ground and with a band of iron and bronze around it in the tender grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew from the sky and share the plants of the earth with the animals. And let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal for seven periods of time, probably about seven years. And this word is by decree of the observer. The matter is a command from the holy ones. This is so the living will know that the Most High is ruler over the kingdoms of men and he gives to anyone he wants and sets it over the lowliest of men. Now I'm going to skip to verse 24 where Daniel interprets now, he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Verse 24 says, this is the interpretation. Your majesty, and this is the sentence that the Most High that has been passed against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from the people to live with the wild animals. You will feed on grass like cattle and be drenched with dew from the sky for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over the kingdoms of men and He gives to anyone He wants. As for the command to leave the tree stump with its roots, your kingdom will be restored to you as soon as you acknowledge that heaven rules. Now look at Daniel's advice to King Nebuchadnezzar. He says, Therefore, may my advice seem good to you, my king. Separate yourselves from your sins by doing what is right and from your injustices by showing mercy to the needy, perhaps there will be an extension of your prosperity. Now, I don't want you to get lost in all the reading of the text, but may I put before you that God says to King Nebuchadnezzar, I've got one final lesson to teach you before eternity. And you will either learn the lesson or you won't. But in essence, God tells King Nebuchadnezzar, your eternal destiny will rest on whether or not you hear this final lesson from heaven. You can hear it or you want, but God says, I am going to put the choice before you as compellingly as I can. Now, this is what God does. It's interesting that God always has to communicate to Nebuchadnezzar when God speaks directly to Nebuchadnezzar in his dreams. Why doesn't God speak to Nebuchadnezzar just out during the day? I think that's because it tells us that during the day, Nebuchadnezzar is walking around his palace, taking an e his ease, and he is so hurried and unfocused that God can't get a word in edgeways. God said, that's fine, Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to get tired. You're going to go lay down. You're going to cut your mind off from your daily business, and then I'm going to step in. About the moment where it says in the text that Nebuchadnezzar took his ease, it says God quickly troubled him with a dream. God's like, I'm going to get my words in here. If you don't listen during the day, you're going to have to listen during the night. And so the dream that God gives Nebuchadnezzar is that there is this huge tree that grows, and it grows in the middle of the earth, and it spreads all over the earth, and it's such a big and glorious tree that even the animals come and gather underneath it. But then, right in the middle of the dream, it's almost like a beautiful dream that's interrupted. A voice from heaven says, cut it down. So I can hear chainsaws. I'm sure it wasn't chainsaws in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but you know, you hear, I mean, brrrr, you know, and then the crash, you know, there comes the tree. It's over. He's got a stump. It's over. Nebuchadnezzar <gasps> wakes up. It's a horrible dream. And it just keeps happening. It keeps happening. It keeps happening. And by the way, even in the dream itself, the tree becomes personified as a man. I often wonder if the wise men that Nebuchadnezzar talked to couldn't understand the dream or they didn't want to tell Nebuchadnezzar the dream. I mean, you know, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out what this dream's about. A tall tree, it's too big, and God says, cut it down, it falls. I, I'm wondering if the wise men were perplexed 
Or if they're like, I ain't going to be the one to tell him that God said he's going to be cut down. No, we don't know. Go get Daniel. He'll, he'll, he'll tell you. And so Daniel does. He steps up. And he says, look, I'm just going to have to cut straight with you. He said, the tree is you. You know, it's interesting that when we get become too much in a delusion, that God almost has to trick us into conviction. I mean, I could show you multiple times throughout the scripture that God tells people a parable. And then people go, well, I can't believe that happens. And it's like, well, you're the person. Oh. You know what I'm saying? A parable has that way of tricking you into going into the story and not knowing where the punchline is. And God goes, whoop, it's you. Like, oh, oh, man, you caught me with that one. I was, I was agreeing with you until it was me. And then I ain't, I ain't with that. And so this is what God's kind of doing with, with, with Nebuchadnezzar. He kind of eases him into the story. And Daniel says, you. And now Nebuchadnezzar, an old man, thinks, I'm going to lose it all. It's over. And Daniel gives him the way out. You know what? The tree is overgrown and it's too high. And rather than God having to cut the tree down, all, Nebuch all Nebuchadnezzar needs to do is bow the tree down. Because it's not a tree, it's him. God says, you either humble yourself or I will humble you. you got the choice. We can do it voluntarily or involuntarily. Which way you want to go? We can go the easy way, we can go the hard way. You make a decision. God put the choice right there before Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel looks at Nebuchadnezzar and says this, Therefore, may my advice seem right to you, my king. Separate yourself from your sins by doing what is right, and from your injustices by showing mercy. Perhaps there will be an extension of your prosperity. He says, look, man, you're already overgrown. You've already flaunted, your, flaunted, flaunted yourself in front of God. You're now overgrown. You might as well bend the tree down, bend yourself down rather than the God have to cut it down. You know what this text is really shouting to us is the moment, the call for repentance. Now, nobody wants to be in this moment. Nobody wants this moment to happen where we just come to realize something's wrong. Spiritual cancer. And the way for removal is humility. The way for removal is agreeing with God. The way for greater cancer growth to happen is opposition to God and resistance to God and pushing God back. And so the truth is, repentance is a tough process. Now, repentance is also a church word. But it's, it's good for you to learn a few church words. Nothing wrong with that. Repentance simply means to agree with God about what He says about your sin, and then to make a change. To make a change. To say, God, I'm going to surrender. And, and a call to repentance. This is what Nebuchadnezzar gets. Here's the thing. A call to repentance doesn't mean you're going to repent. It only means that God is giving you a gracious opportunity to do it. You say, man, I hate coming to church when, you know, the preacher kind of pushes down with both fists. Well, I hate being the preacher that does it, quite frankly, if I do it. But it's, it's God's grace that's doing that. A, a call to repentance doesn't mean you're going to repent. It just means that God is actually being heard, that his conviction power is being felt, and that is an act of grace. It doesn't always happen. The Bible says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Why is that? Because if today you harden your heart, tomorrow it gets harder to hear the voice of God, and thus you can be in great peril and not even know it. And so the call to repentance comes. Nebuchadnezzar hears it. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no. You know what? That's a real sad state. That God put it right there before Nebuchadnezzar said, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm giving you a ticket out, man. Just repent right now, this moment. Get out. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no. And God doesn't give Nebuchadnezzar just one Sunday at church. He gives Nebuchadnezzar 12 months. He says, now you know what I want. You're going to do it or not? And Nebuchadnezzar says, no, I'm not. You know, when you tell God no, God doesn't go, oh, well, what am I going to do now? Oh, you said no. I guess checkmate. You just got me, didn't you? You just, well, I can't. Well, you know what? I told you. Now you now I don't know what to do. God's, God says sometimes, all right. You said no, huh? Yep, no. He says, okay. I got other options. They just aren't as easy. 
He said, just like a parent who loves a child, I'm going to love you right now. He said, this is going to hurt. And so here it goes. Third point. God reigns. Though God may choose to discipline us, not to hurt us, but to redeem us, to awaken us of our need for Him. Verse 28 says, All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, the king exclaimed, This is a stupid statement. All right? If you want me to put it on, this is a stupid statement. All right? Is this not Babylon the great that I have built by my vast power to be a royal residence and to display my majestic glory? That's a stupid statement. Because then it says, verse 31, While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven. The real king decided he was going to have a word in edgeways here. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. I told you. you. Didn't listen. It's gone. It says, You will be driven away from the people to live with the wild animals, and you will feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over the kingdoms of men, and it gives, and he gives to anyone he wants. At that moment, the sentence against Nebuchadnezzar was executed. He was driven away from the people. He ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle feathers. And his nails like bird claws. It didn't keep himself up, no doubt. I told Mark, I said, if you come by the church and I'm outside on the front lawn eating grass, something terrible is going to happen. God said, you didn't listen, boy. <laughs> something terrible's happened. This is a sad part of the story. You know, if we were watching this today, we'd say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar had a nervous breakdown, oh, he had a psychological break. God would say, I don't care what he had, I'm trying to get his attention. He was so overinflated, and I asked him to bow, and he wouldn't bow, so I just said, well, there you go. You know, it's interesting, most of us today probably have enough sin in our life that if it wasn't for God's grace to just hold us together, we'd probably fall apart. You ever seen people just struggle forever and just don't ever seem to fall apart? And you want to know, why is that the case? Because God, in His grace, sustains His world. And I believe at any moment, in any of our lives, if God just said, you know, I'm just going to take my grace away, we'd be a mess. If He just said, all right, Rusty, I'm going to give you over to yourself now. Do what you want to do. We'd be a mess. Be horrible. God just told Nebuchadnezzar, all right, Nebuchadnezzar, you want me to just, just take my hands off of you and let you be what you want to be? In that moment, he becomes the man who thought he was almost God, God now allows to go to a subhuman state. You know what's crazy? It took him seven years to really get it straight. Which means that this wasn't a little small problem that Nebuchadnezzar had. It was, it was like a cancer that had wrapped around his soul. I mean, it looked like to me, you know, two or three nights out in the field like this. I'd have been, all right, God, whatever you need, I'm ready to get out the cold and put some clothes on and cut my fingernails, right? I mean, you know, never, no, seven years. He roams around, and finally he gets it. You say, Rusty, why in the world would this happen? What is this? Is God looking to punish us? No, this is God's gracious discipline. You say, Rusty, why in the world would God allow painful discipline to happen? There's one simple reason. To allow redemptive possibilities that are inaccessible in any other way. You say, Rusty, why aren't they accessible in any other way? Because you've shut the door. God has already given quite a few ways to Nebuchadnezzar. He could have repented when Daniel interpreted his first dream. He could have repented when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were almost martyred, but God delivered them. He could have repented when Daniel put the call to repentance before him, but no, nope, none of those. And God says, all right, you've closed off all the possibilities, so I have to use this one to allow redemptive possibilities that weren't accessible any other way. Listen, Nebuchadnezzar being in this state was God's judgment, However, it was a redemptive judgment for Nebuchadnezzar to be saved. 
God does not want to punish people. He doesn't. If he wanted to punish us all, it says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. That's the point. And God will rattle our cages as much as he needs to for us to open our eyes that we're on the way of death through the way of life. And that's what he's doing for Nebuchadnezzar. This is good pain that God is trying to set a broken soul back in line with him to save his life. And the fourth and final point, the redemptive note. As Nebuchadnezzar leaves the book of Daniel, he leaves the book bruised and battered by life, but redeemed. Well, what a good ending. The fourth point, it says God reigns, so it is right for us to honor him and possess humility. Verse 34 says, But at the end of those days I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. It's real repentance happening. And my sanity returned to me, and I praised the Most High and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and He does what He wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? that time my sanity returned to me and my majesty and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out. I was reestablished over my kingdom and even more greatness came to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the God of heaven because all his works are true and his ways are just and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. He's learned his lesson. This is more important than anything Nebuchadnezzar has ever done. Is at the end of his life, he finally got it right. You say, Rusty, why in the world would God work so hard with Nebuchadnezzar? Because Nebuchadnezzar was a great ruler on this earth, but prior to this moment, he wasn't a citizen in the only kingdom that mattered. And so God was saying, look, Nebuchadnezzar, you've been a good king by human standards. You've done a lot. Babylon the Great. You've been a great ruler on this earth, but wouldn't it be a shame for you to be such a great ruler on this earth and not even be a citizen in the kingdom of God that will reign forever and ever? And by the way, Nebuchadnezzar, there's one huge requirement to entrance into the kingdom of God that is, first of all, saying, God, I admit I am a sinner. I think that this entire message could be summed up in one beatitude of Jesus, which simply says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The words of Jesus, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus says, no kingdom entrance without spiritual bankruptcy. He further goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn, mourn over their sin, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, the lowly, the downcast, for they will inherit the earth, the earth to come, the world to come, the life to come. This is entrance into God's kingdom. And so the message today is really simple. Do you need to make a change? Is God saying, look, I want to take you somewhere. I want to go somewhere with you. And we're going to, we're, I'm, going to, I'm not going to give up on my end of the deal. God says, I am going to seek and save those who are lost. I will leave the 99 behind to go find the one. I will sweep the house clean to find the lost coin. I will leave the son behind to go find the prodigal. God says, I am determined to keep the choice of my love before you. And the question today is, will you receive it? If God today is pulling at your heart, then this is the moment.
call to repentance doesn't mean that you have to repent. Doesn't mean when the music is sung in a moment that you have to make a decision. It only means that God is gracious enough to tug at your heart and give you an option to repent, which is an act of overwhelming grace to us. For He does not have to do that for us. He chooses to do that for us out of His love. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian, why wait? If you are a Christian, God says, look, I've been trying to deal with you about this issue for weeks, months, years, decades. Will you hear my voice today? And by the way, if you say no, God doesn't say, oh, well, I guess I won't, I'll just leave him alone. At least you hope God doesn't say that. He'll just turn up the heat to put the decision before you in another way that you can understand. And I pray that we would hear Daniel's call to Nebuchadnezzar would be our call to us. Put your sin away, and then God will show you grace. In just a few moments, the praise band's going to come. I'm going to pray. I'm just going to let them sing a verse or two without you singing, just to digest some of this stuff. After two or three verses, you can sing along. Mark will cue you in when you can, can sing. But I want you to stand, but I just want you to think, God, are you trying to deal with me? What are you trying to say to me? Help me sort it out. Help me respond appropriately. And God, help me avoid stronger discipline because I'm just not hearing your voice in this moment. If you're not a Christian, also, I'm here at the front. Heavenly Father, we just realize that uh, we often can't see ourselves. God, sometimes we can and don't like what we see, so we shut the door. And so, God, we just we thank you for this story in the Bible. God, help us to see past all the life events of Nebuchadnezzar to see your love and grace pursuing a man, well, who didn't want to be a part of your kingdom. And God, we thank you that you love, love us enough to help us change our minds, to help us see you for who you are. And so, God, today, in these moments, may they be holy moments, sacred moments, God, may we, like Nebuchadnezzar and Isaiah and Moses and Abraham and the great apostles and all the rest, see you and confirm once again that we're undone. We're, we're full of problems, and yet we want to take the next spiritual step and be the person you want us to be. God, we, we realize that our journey in the spiritual life begins with real humil humility poverty of spirit, the meekness, the mourning over sin. And so, God, if there needs to be any of that done right now, God, I pray it would be done. God, that uh, we would align our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. I've wandered far away, now I'm coming home, the paths of sin to love I try, Lord, 
final prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you work in a redemptive way in all of our lives. We thank you that the story of King Nebuchadnezzar ends is him not on the throne of his life, but God with him on bended knee, giving praise and glory and honor to you. God, as we leave from this place, we pray that that is the posture of our soul. God, if it's not, continue to work with us. Speak to our heart until that day where we confess you as Lord and King. In Jesus' name, amen.